There we go. Can you turn to the book of Joel, please? Uh, the book of Joel, chapter 1, from verses 1 to 14, is what we're going to read together. But we're going to be looking at the whole prophecy of Joel. So we're going to read together from Joel's prophecy, the book of Joel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And then we're going to look at the whole prophecy. I've entitled this sermon, Come Lie All Night. Come Lie All Night. Lie as in lay, not lie as in anything else we might be tempted to do. But before we come to this message, let's pray. Lord, I want to praise you for your word again, for the plumb line that is amongst us. We pray that it might be that in our hearts this afternoon as we hear what you have to say. Lord, I pray that you would use me and my lips. Lord, that I wouldn't pull up short of what you would have me say and do. Lord, that I wouldn't go over or beyond where you would have me tread. And Lord, I pray that you would Please make this your own by the power of your spirit. Take things out and add things in as you wish, Lord, I pray. And I pray that you would soften all of our hearts, Lord, that we might have ear-shaped hearts that would receive with hunger and a passion to obey what you have for us this afternoon. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. <coughs> Joel chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethelon. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all your inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns, for the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Wail in vine dresses for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth. You who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. John's prophecy is an amazing part of Scripture. 
it's visceral, it's really, really striking in so many ways. Joel's name means Jehovah is God. It's a confession and at the same time, if you like, a mission statement. A New Testament, New Covenant comparator might be Jesus is Lord. It's a declaration and a bold one of that. Joel's message is to Judah, the southern nation of God's people after it was split in the time of Rehoboam. It's a curious prophecy and a curious book of scripture in the sense that we can't be sure at all about what date Joel was ministering into. There's no mention of specific historical events, no real mention of Gentile nations specifically, no names of kings or priests. And it could in reality be anywhere between 835 and 400 BC. It could be pre-exile. So Israel, the northern nation, went into exile in 71 BC. Judah, the southern nation, went into exile in 586 BC. Or Joel could have been ministering into a post-exile period. It's not super critical that we get tied up in that because there is absolute and universal application for all of us across all time. However, I share this in part by way of interest, but in part because it may bear particular relevance to us. That there are a number of modern scholars, David Guzik and John MacArthur amongst them, who would posit Joel's prophecy at 835 BC, or very close to it. If that is the case, then let me paint a very brief picture of what was going on at that point in time. You may remember a queen mother by the name of Ataliah, uh, who uh, ministered, uh, shall we say, or, or took uh, reign uh, around that time. And she was Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, or niece, depending on how we interpret her title, and she was of Israel. She married Jehoram, the king of Judah, who was Jehoshaphat's son, and she brought Baal, or Baal, as you might pronounce it, with her. Ahaziah, their son, became the king of Judah. He was evil, just like Ahab, and his mother made sure that he went that way. He was influenced by Ahab's counsellors that his mum very kindly arranged. The holy temple contents were devoted to Baal. Jehoram, or Joram, as he's sometimes titled, the king of Israel, Ahab's son, and Ahaziah worked together until Jehu killed them both during his great revolution. You may remember Jehu, son of Nimshi, the crazy chariot driver, who said, come see my zeal for the Lord. His great revolution sees Ahab's house expunged, and he himself becomes the king of Israel. Now, Ataliah's response to this is to kill all the heirs, all her grandsons, except for one who is hidden away in the temple for six years whilst Ataliah reigned. His name was Joash or Jehoash, depending on the title and the scriptures that you read it. That had been while Ataliah reigned. If she couldn't be influenced by proxy, she influenced directly. And after six years, the priest Jehoiada brings army and bodyguards into the temple, asks them to protect Jehoash, who is crowned in David's name, given the law, and proclaimed publicly. Ataliah shows up, cries treason. It's like this great drama that Shakespeare would have been proud of. She's taken outside and slain. A covenant is made between the people and the Lord. Baal is removed from the temple entirely. Now, that may be the specific historical time period, it may not be, but the reason that I share that is because at this time period, and it's also the same in many of the time periods throughout the kings of Israel, and in this particular case, Judah, despite Jehu's zealous revolution, and despite the new king Jehoash seeking to follow the Lord, the high places in Dan and Bethel, the golden calves which the people were encouraged to go and worship and offer sacrifices, had still not been removed from the land yet. God's people had gone so far, but not all the way. And that's the critical point, I think, by way of context. Let's just have a look at the structure of Joel. If we were to, if we were to divide it into five sections, we might have the first section 
from the first verse of the first chapter through to the 11th verse of the second chapter, and I would title it thus, My plague brings you pain and you protest. We've got a real plague of locusts and an apparent drought, both of which, make no mistake, were sent by God. You see that in verse 11 of chapter 2, they were God's eye. Secondly, you have a lack of food out in the field. And thirdly, as a consequence of that, God's people have nothing to offer to God by way of their traditional religious practice of offerings and sacrifices. The second section of Joel, you might say, would be those verses, chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, where God is saying, come and cry out to me, because I am good. The third section is those uh, next three verses in chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, which are an injunction by the Lord to intercede now. The fourth section, verses 18 to 27 of chapter 2, God is saying this, I will have mercy and I will restore you. And the fifth section, chapter 2, verse 28, right through to the end of chapter 3, God is saying, I will save my people through my Messiah. I will save my people through my Messiah. A great future looking passage of scripture. There are some specific emphases in this prophecy that I would entitle the call, the call, God's call to his people, that I want us to just pick up on as we go through some verses, if we may, in chapters 1 and 2. So just follow these words as I go through these verses with me. Follow them in your Bible, starting at chapter 1 and verse 5. Chapter 1 and verse 5, we have the words, wake up. It's the very first part of God's call to his people. Wake up. In verse 8, God says, lament, mourn, grieve, and put it into words. Lament. In verse 11 of chapter 1, be ashamed and wail. It's sort of left in stuff, isn't it? There is a recurring theme, no doubt. Verse 13 of chapter 1, gird yourselves, lament, there it is for the second time, wail, there it is for the second time, and then those words, come, lie all night, in sackcloth. Verse 14, fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders into the house of the Lord, gather all the inhabitants into the house of the Lord, cry out to the Lord. Verse 1 of chapter 2, blow the trumpet, tremble. Verse 12 of chapter 2, turn to me with all your heart, fast, that's there for the second time, weep, mourn, rend, that means tear your heart it says in verse 13, return to the Lord. Verse 15 of chapter 2, blow the trumpet, Fast, blow the trumpet, that was the second time. Fast, for the third time we see there in verse 15 of chapter 2. Call a sacred assembly, Joel repeats himself again there. Verse 16 of chapter 2 just hits me. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and babies, and postpone or cancel your wedding or your honeymoon, it depends on exactly how you interpret those words in chapter 2 verse 16. But either the honeymoon or the wedding, cancel it, stop it, this is more important. Imagine that. Imagine that. Verse 17 in chapter 2, we, for the third time we see there, between the porch and the altar, that's speaking to the priests, and then say, we might consider prayer, what he's saying to us. Verse 17 there. Verse 21 of chapter 2, don't fear, God says. Verse 22 of chapter 2, he says, don't be afraid for the second time. Important. 
And then in verse 23, be glad and rejoice. What does this mean for us today? It's obviously a very clear, very specific, very practical call to God's people way back when. As grafted in believers in the Messiah today, who can attain to this relationship, this covenant relationship that we have with Almighty God. As Joel spoke then, what does God say now to us right here today? Well, those two little sections particularly, chapter 2 verses 15 to 17, and chapter 1 verse 30, hit me so hard late one evening in a small town in North Yorkshire and I can still remember, I can remember where I, where I was sat, I can remember the way the light shone through the window, I can remember how hot it was, it was a summer's night and I was out serving uh, the community as a church based evangelist and on the way back from my job that evening, I don't jog very often, just occasionally, but on my way back that night I bumped into two young men, two teenagers, who I knew we'd been reaching out to them for some months. They came to our youth nights. They were from a very, very broken background. One young man was already in a secure boarding school on account of his violent tendencies. Very withdrawn, very sullen, quite intimidating really, even at the age of 15. The other was an absolute tyro of emotion and banter and madness and his dad didn't live at home and his mum was struggling with him and both of them lived just round the corner from me and as I bumped into them that night and I spent 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes with them trying to spend time that would count for the kingdom, trying to minister to them the truth of God's glory and his plan for their lives through the purple haze of the weed that they'd already been smoking that night as they laughed, and as I laughed with them, and tried but failed, my heart was dragging behind me on the road on the way home. Because I was despondent. I had tried to reach those boys so many times before, and I had tried to reach so many boys and girls just like that. We've spent time praying for those kinds of young people today, and it still breaks my heart, and I went home and sometimes you have these moments with the Lord, don't you? Where you just rock up and you say, Lord, what is the point? Will they ever, ever turn? Can their hearts ever really be opened? They know nothing of what I'm speaking to them about. The devastating postscript to that little story of meeting was that the young man that I mentioned with violent tendencies, not long after that, robbed the corner shop at the end of my street and went round to another road further down and battered some people with golf clubs and went to where the young friends was to cheat. I was so desperate that God might work and change the trajectory of their lives. And when I came to God and I said, what is the point? Why am I doing this? Will they ever listen? Will there ever be a breakthrough? These verses in Joel hit me like a steam train. I've never really spent much time in Joel or really understood what it really meant for me today. But the message was simple. God said to me, Josh, the harness fails because the house isn't right. And suddenly for me, intercession and the cold hard streets came together and made sense. Because that's what Joel was saying. You're bothered about your lack of harvest, I'm bothered about the lack in my house. Let's talk. And this is what the Lord is saying to us. I was reminded afresh of that two nights ago on a street just outside my house. We'll be trying to minister to some young people and remind me of the young people I've just shared a story about. Again, that emptiness, the vacancy, the, we've got no idea what you're talking about. 
the despondency, the pain, the anger, the violence. I've been around the church for a while now. Many of you may regard me as a young man. Dave will lay still thinks he's a young man. That means I am too. I've been around the church a few years now. Never have I ever been a part of what Joel is describing to us. Never seen a church leader suggest that this is what we should do. Never seen anything cancelled or stopped that we might do this. And I realised that night, and that was eight years ago, and I still realise it today, that this is where we must come. This is the answer. This. This invitation. Come, lie, all night. It doesn't sound very inviting and glamorous, does it? It isn't. But it's still God's invitation to us today. And my question to myself and my question to you would be, have you and I RSVP'd to God's call through Joel? If not, why not? What is stopping us? I'm not for one second saying that this doesn't happen in the Church of God in other places. I happened across an invitation to an all-night prayer vigil and a crying out to God for revival in our nation that's taking place in Manchester on Friday the 17th, not long from now. I'm just saying that I've never experienced it. And my heart is hungry for it. And I don't necessarily know what it will be like. But until we get here, nothing will change out there. It's that simple. And that's what impresses me about Joel. He's so blunt. I think there's three barriers, perhaps, that we need to break through. Three barriers. There's, there's more than that, no doubt. But as I look at this and I consider my own heart, there's three things perhaps that we can talk about. The first is this. Our fear of stopping. Our fear of stopping. The national response to COVID-19 has halted much of our church routines and even at times affected the food supplies of our nation. It's a striking echo of what the locusts did to Judah. Can you hear and feel the church machinery clunking back into action as we speak? Can you feel that? What have we learnt from the pandemic? Are we better at Zoom and Facebook and YouTube while our communities waste away and our hearts still hunger for reality? Are we going to go back and just do what we did before? Joel is a call to stop and repent. Not just rinse and repeat. And yet that's where I resort back to. That's my default setting. That's the plight of all humans on the face of this earth. And God knows it. And that's why he sends his word to say, stop. My mind was taken back to a prophecy that the Lord gave Lance Lambert on the 6th of August 2011. I'll read his words that the Lord gave him. False religion, the work of world rulers of darkness, cover your eyes. A Laodicean church, neither hot nor cold, rumbles on like machinery. It is a church where I am outside of its routine, its organisation and its methodology. It is Christianity without me. He goes on to say some other things and then the Lord finishes with this. It will cost you everything to stand in the gap. But you will enter into my heart and know deep fellowship with me. Such travail conceived in your heart by my spirit will cost you deeply. 
but it will end in my throne and glory. That was 10 years ago. I think the second barrier might be this, our sleepy belief that we have plenty of time. We all know that. We all get that as humans. We understand that danger. In Joel, we see a real, horrifying, visceral, painful, physical plague. Imagine a horde of locusts destroying everything you'd laboured for for that season, that year, and then clamouring at the window frame to come in the house. Imagine that. But they existed to be a physical plague that would be a spiritual harbinger of the persecution which was to come. That's what you see in chapter 3. The Lord is bringing a judgment on his people that will see them go into exile. Radical crushing persecution. If we think that lockdown and what that has been like is a harbinger to us of a godless government and an apostate church that will one day soon lock our churches down and lock our people up. I think we're then beginning to understand something of what Joel's saying. It was that real for them. And it's got to be that real for us. It's not a history lesson. God is saying, stop now before it's too late. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 45, I think is one of the most terrifying and most comforting verses that I have come across. It says this, Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. There in the garden, Jesus was desperate, desperate to share his final moments of intercession with his Father, with the disciples, that he would build his church on. He was desperate to bring them into that place, not to experience his fear, not to experience suffering, but to know his heart, to enter into his heart, to understand his relationship with his father, to understand the present weight of the sins that he was about to go to the cross for. It wasn't about physical torture, it was about spiritual torment, deep grief. And yet those who wanted to be closest to him were asleep. I'm terrified by the prospect of missing out on the heart of God for the season we live in. But I'm comforted that those who were supposed to be there were tired and not tired, because I do too. <laughs> I think the third barrier that I would mention here is our preference for petitions over his presence. Our preference for petitions over his presence. I think this is where it gets particularly real and very practical for us. Petition asking the Lord for produce for a harvest, a soul harvest, perhaps healings, perhaps that desire we have for hype and seeing things happen, anything, anything can, and it says that word can become an idolatrous religion that eclipses an actual real relationship with the Lord. There is a perverse truth about our nature and the house of God 
that putting on services and evangelistic endeavours are often actually easier than waiting in his presence. I think many of you know what I'm talking about. We'd rather go out there and do some work than wait in here and listen. And the Lord takes us into a place of paucity. He takes us into a place of without. He takes us into a place of lack that we might finally come in desperation to the one that we know can do something about. And you see that in Joel chapter 1 and verse 9. Because when you read those words, it makes sense. Joel 1 verse 9 says, The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. He brings us into this place that we might feel it and see him. And that's what you see in verses 13 and 14. This is John's application for us here now today. Like Judah in that day and age, and perhaps Jehu, who did so much, but didn't go all the way with his revolution. We have come so far, praise God. The Lord has brought us so far to a place of interceding and wanting to come in and pray and know him and pray for our nation. But I believe another step yet is required. Let me read you these words and let me see if you recognise them. We'll get some serious IFB bonus points if you do. Wouldn't it be good if we, as a nation, so sought God through prayer and fasting that he moved in mighty power upon us so that other nations joined us to seek God's blessing? As a result, we might see not only a mighty revival in Britain, but also right across the face of the earth. Let's not just fast to grieve over former glories or the present state of our nation or even for our blessing, but fast out of a genuine desire to seek God himself. I have a feeling that if we fasted like that, God would delight in turning our fasts into joyful feasts. We could have some real celebrations then. Any guesses on who said that? Who wrote that? Ray, Ray Bollais wrote those words in 1986. And very prescient they are for our time today. To finish, we have one almighty encouragement. One almighty encouragement. That's almighty with a capital A, by the way. Turn to Revelation 3 as we land this plane. I just want to read two verses. Verse 19 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. This is Jesus speaking to the church. Revelation 3, 19 and 20 says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now is the time, friends, and he will meet us there. He will. There is a more central aim of prayer here that is beyond praying for issues and people, worthy and commanded, though they are. But this is about crying out to God for revival. Revival in here, revival in here, and then, please God, revive like that. In this place, 
in his presence, our outpouring, our hearts poured out, becomes the offering to him. That is what he is looking for. Never the hands principally, always the heart. Genuine relationship worship and intercession with repentance. Not religion. This is where I believe intercessors for Britain as a movement we need to be. This is where we need to point ourselves in this moment of time, in this part of history. Times are becoming very serious, very dark, and very urgent. And we have to circle our tents around this place. It's awkward at times. It won't be simple. It won't involve clean and tidy schedules. But the Lord invites us in. And he will be faithful to meet us there in a powerful way. Perhaps this new year coming, the conference that we're going to be doing, is an opportunity to do just that. As we wait on the Lord, my sister shared that verse. What is the Lord's remedy for the heart cry that we have in our hearts for the children and the generation to come? The Lord says to cry. <laughs> to just break. Just come and let me break your heart. That's all he's ever wanted. All he wants to do is break our hearts. Nothing else. Just come and be heartbroken. Just come and break. Just weep and cry and lay all night. I've never seen that done corporately. But I want it. And I pray that together we might move forward. Take that opportunity and work at us. For us in here. For them out there, for his glory. Amen. Let's pray. So good. So, so good. Lord, please, will you take us by the hand? Holy Spirit, please, will you blow upon us? Jesus, may we find you so real, so much more real than anything else going on around us. Take us to a place, Lord, where all we have is you, and all we want is you. You can do in a moment what we could never do in a million lifetimes. You are God, and we are not, and yet, Lord, you reach down to us. And we just praise you for your word. We pray, Lord, help us to stand, to rise up, and to respond to that invitation in a new way. Thank you. We worship you.